All right, thank you. Now that the patient is in your clinic and you have established a rapport, don't get immunizations, but care about the mental health. I think now we're in for a treat because Dr. Francine Kuros, who is a professor of clinical uh, psychiatry at Columbia University and a principal investigator of the New Jersey, New York AETC, or the other way around, New York, New Jersey <laughs> AETC. And uh, she's worked in HIV and the interface of HIV and mental health for 40 years. So we can't have a better uh, person to address these issues here and uh, edited two books and written numerous uh, books and chapters and, and articles. And for people like Dr. Kunos, antiretroviral therapy is the low hanging fruit and it's been picked by shorter people. So now we go beyond viral suppression and how to address mental health directly uh, uh, and reduce morbidity and mortality in people with HIV. So please welcome Mr. Kunos. can't get much shorter than me, unfortunately. <clears throat> um, anyway, it's an honor to be here. And uh, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an honor to be here. And I'm going to um, try to make some very specific points of why it's important to address mental health in HIV. So I first have to learn how to use this thing. OK, go ahead. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I have no conflicts of interest and get no extra money from anybody. Um, these are the uh, basic points of the objectives that I'm hoping to achieve. But what I really hope to achieve, aside from these very nicely worded objectives, is that you come away understanding that mental illness is not in simply a psychosocial comorbidity. Mental illness kills people. And if there's one thing to take away, it's the fatality of mental illness. OK, so here's my first audience and my only audience response question. In 2021, the leading cause of death among people in the US with HIV ages 25 to 44 Oh, I can look at it there. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for pointing out. I can look at it right there. Boy, what do I know? Anyway, uh, it's, technology is hard for people my age. <clears throat> uh, so what was the leading cause of death uh, in people with HIV after COVID? COVID disease accounted for 33% of deaths. What came second? Cancer, heart disease, overdose, COVID-19, or hepatitis C? The second leading cause of death in people with HIV, 25 to 44. And I should tell you, I actually tried to look for recent data uh, that was this new for older patients and did not find it. So if somebody knows where it exists, that would be great. So if you would vote. Hmm. Yeah, you guys are great. You know, oh my gosh, that the answer is overdose. And I think that's a very important thing because if you think about what we listen to frequently at our meetings, um, there's a lot of focus, not at this meeting where it's wonderful to include it. There's a lot of focus on all the many medical disorders that are comorbidities of HIV infection. But it's been very hard to really get attention paid uh, to the problem of overdose deaths in our population. And I really welcome the talk that we had yesterday where um, the discussion of integrating buprenorphine treatment into HIV care was given such high priority. If you want to save life, that's really one of the important things to do. <clears throat> so mental health problems are just traveling with HIV. It's a syndemic, right? We know that we're dealing with a syndemic. But mental health is there throughout every phase of HIV infection. 
it starts with acquiring HIV infection. Um, people who are at risk for HIV have more mental illnesses before they're HIV infected, and that puts them at increased risk. It's an outcome of learning you're HIV infected, the level of distress that people have um, after they learn that, and the adjustments that people have to make to knowing they're HIV positive. It's a comorbidity of HIV infection, and that's true Be with all medical illnesses. The more medical illnesses you have, the more mental illnesses you have. These are comorbidities that just travel together. And it's a cause of morbidity and mortality among people with HIV infection. So for a long time, it's frustrated me that, the pe that people say the reason to treat mental illness is to get better viral load suppression. I agree that viral load suppression is a really, really important outcome. But that's actually only one reason to treat mental illness. And it's less relevant in 2023 than it used to be, because um, we're much more focused on preventing new infections, in which case you're not going to be measuring viral load. Um, we know that people, people with aging with HIV frequently have suppressed viral load, but have a lot of comorbidities which they feel are not well attended to. And we know that we need to further narrow the mortality gap between uh, people with HIV and the general population or people who are at risk. And one of the things that prevents us from narrowing the gap is mental disorders. <clears throat> So yesterday we heard about structural problems in the healthcare system from the perspective of healthcare workers. Um, that is too long a conversation. It would take all my time to talk about the structural problems. <laughs> but I just wanted to say we have a lot of structural problems in our healthcare system that really um, make it hard to deliver the care that we need to deliver. And I'm not going to elaborate on them, but I listed some of them. And the other huge issue for mental illness is stigma. And it's alive and well, and always has been, and it's there everywhere in the world. I've never gone anywhere where stigma didn't affect how people responded to mental illness. Um, so it's just a persistent barrier. It's not only a barrier, it's a barrier not only from the healthcare provider point of view, where often people aren't comfortable, but it's also a barrier from the patient point of view where it's hard to admit to having a mental illness. Now, I've been on a one-person campaign to destigmatize mental illness by talking about my own mental illnesses, which is not a topic of today's talk. Um, but I figure if psychiatrists can't talk about it, who's supposed to, right? So here's a study that looks at people who are HIV negative and are they likely to stay HIV negative? And it looks at five different conditions. One is depression, the next three are substance use disorders. And the last one is the social determinants of health, in this case, childhood sexual abuse. And you can see with each condition, the likelihood of remaining HIV negative goes down. So that's the way in which it's really a precursor of getting HIV infection. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about mental illness versus mental wellness, because um, I have to say, you know, we, we psychiatrists are a psychiatrist are trained to think about mental illness. I think psychologists are trained a little better to think about wellness. It's really not a theme in psychiatric training. You know, are you, are you sick with a mental illness or aren't you, right? But what happened with COVID was that so many people were under such a level of distress that we got very involved in thinking about mental wellness. And mental wellness is really, can never be the exclusive province of behavioral health care providers. There just aren't enough behavioral health care providers in the world to address mental wellness. So we heard a talk yesterday about how we as health care workers can address mental wellness. Um, but I think it's also important to know that we're doing this with our patients. And the reason we're doing with our, this with our patients is that there's two reasons why we have to address mental wellness with patients. One is the biggest factor in people failing treatment is not adhering to care. You have to be able to talk to your patients about that. You can't be calling a behavioral health provider every time you think a patient walks out the door and might not take your treatment. And, um, the, and the other is um, 
<clears throat> you know, hmm. it's, it's linked to uh, whether people are going to not, not only adhere, but even understand your recommendations. So if the patient walks out the door and doesn't really understand anything you've said about what they're supposed to do, they're much less likely to follow the treatment. So you want to really be careful to make sure your patients um, understand what they need to do and you're not depending on a behavioral health care provider to provide that. Now, the interesting thing to me is that the mind and the brain and the body, especially the brain and the body, have absolutely no separation whatsoever. We train healthcare providers as if there's a cutoff right here at the neck. There is no cutoff. And you want to know something interesting is that we know there's no cutoff because it's in our ordinary speech. Think about our expressions that tell you that emotions are in the body. Chills ran down my spine. My heart skipped a beat. I had a knot in my stomach. Emotions are in your body and they're in your mind. We know it. We also know that the brain is the master organ of the body. It really is the primary guide to tell the body what to do and to pick up what the body is experiencing and give feedback about how to respond to that. So the brain is really the in-charge organ in your body, even though it may not get a lot of attention. And I want to mention the brain is extremely complicated. You only want to be a psychiatrist if you like complexity and confusion. Um, the brain has an estimated 86 billion neurons and a tri 100 trillion synaptic connections and is utter utterly unique from one person to another. Everyone sitting in this room, even if you're identical twin, has a completely unique brain. There's no one in the world with a brain like yours. Now, you could feel very good about that, but when a psychiatrist has to take care of patients and everybody's going to come in with a unique brain, that's a challenge. And finally, the brain is important because generally speaking, we often think of brain death as the major definition of death. Um, I know now they're harvesting organs and people with brain death and there's all kinds of controversy, but pretty much most people agree when there's brain death, someone has died. Um, and I already mentioned not adherence, but I just want to also say the other big issue that's been extremely well documented is that our lifespans are shortened by unhealthy behavior. Unhealthy behaviors trump everything in terms of premature mortality. They trump things like your genetics, the quality of the medical care you get. They are the primary cause of premature death. So we have to really think about unhealthy behaviors as something that's part and parcel of all medical care. And clinicians are on the front lines trying to help people with their unhealthy behaviors, and there's a lot that you can do. Now, I just want to throw in, one of the things you don't want to do is get frustrated. So I like what David Spock just said about first you come in, you make rapport with a patient. People are stubborn. That's in the nature of human a character, to be stubborn. So you have to understand, people come in and they will do certain things and they won't do certain things. And it's not your job to convince them the minute they walk in the office to do something different. It's your job to make a project out of trying to understand how we help people over time look at their behaviors more realistically and change them. I'm not going to go over this because we did it yesterday. We already had a conversation from, in this case, it was directed at healthcare providers. But I did want to mention there's a lot of things we're supposed to do to stay well. And, uh, and, and some tools were mentioned, but I also wanted to mention the uh, Veterans Administration whole health approach. Uh, what I like about it, it has some very nice matching materials. So what you can find are handouts for clinicians to teach each of these things to patients. Uh, and then a corresponding handout for a patient uh, that you can give the patient. So the clinician has a handout, the patient has a handout, and it helps guide you through how can you help your patients, you know, cope with grief, whatever it is that, you know, you're dealing with. I like to distinguish between mental distress and mental disorders, but I'm going to tell you that there's something in between as well. Mental distress happens all the time. And a lot of it doesn't need a behavioral health care provider. 
If your patient comes in and they've just been evicted from their house, a mental health care provider isn't going to be helping them. You know, somebody might help them, but it's not a mental health problem. It's a loss of housing problem. Um, so anything can cause distress. Not everything that's causing it is something that requires behavioral health attention. Um, a lot of distress doesn't meet criteria for mental disorders, as we currently define them, and it often responds well to supportive strategies. So even as a psychiatrist, if a patient is new and comes into my office, I don't think about giving a psychiatric treatment first. I actually think about, is there something this patient can do that would reduce their level of stress, that would get them into a better mental space before I launch into the armamentarium of what we have available in behavioral health. By contrast, mental disorders are well defined. They're defined in the International Classification of Diseases and also in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. They cause severe distress or, or, or significant impairment. And that's where we really need our evidence-informed mental health interventions, such as psychotropic medication and psychotherapy. Now, in between distress and mental disorders are strategies to prevent mild symptoms of mental illness progressing to more severe symptoms of mental illness, which I'm not going to address. <clears throat> so in, in psychiatry, we have the Bible. Here's our Bible, and it makes the American Psychiatric Association a lot of money. Okay, Psychiatry's Bible. This is the latest version published it, it, in book form, the DSM-5-TR, which is a, means text revision. And believe it or not, it's 1,050 pages long. Can you imagine that there's that much to say? And it includes everything. There's no separation between, oh, it's a substance use, oh, it's mental illness, oh, it's cognitive impairment. No, everything is in this manual. Everything is considered a mental disorder. So it's important to know that. What happened in the latest version, which actually was issued, the DSM-5 in 2013, is that we started to take apart some of the more common mental disorders and put them into their own unique categories. And the reason why that's important is that it makes a difference in terms of how you're going to approach patients to understand, for example, we used to say affective disorders, but the reality is that people who have depressive disorders and never get hypomanic or manic are a very different population to treat than people who have bipolar disorders and fluctuate in, 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 and get periods of being high. They're, they're so different to treat, and I actually think bipolar disorder, in my own experience, is one of the most challenging disorders to treat because when people are in a good phase of hypomania, just enough mania, they are really on fire. And uh, a lot of very famous people had bipolar disorder, so it is associated with creativity. Okay, we used to lump everything to, into anxiety disorder, but now we have obsessive compulsive disorder and trauma and uh, related stressor disorders. It's nice that we've written 1,050 pages, but we don't understand the brain whatsoever. It's like the web telescope. We're just trying to figure out what's out there. So there's a huge initiative. It was, there was an article in the New York Times recently in October, um, and basically it said that there had just been a whole slew of publications in very prestigious journals looking at the cells that have, exist in the brain. So we have this long-standing initiative. We're going to find the cells that exist in the brain. We are only beginning. We've only identified 3,300 3, different types of cells in the brain. It's nowhere near where we're going to wind up. Um, and most of them, we have no idea what they do. So it's wonderful to have the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual because, you know, that's what we go by uh, when we make a diagnosis and submit a bill. But the reality is that people jump from one diagnosis to another because we really don't understand the brain. <clears throat> And this just elaborates on it, that we don't have biological tests except for substance use disorders, um, little in the way of objective measures, um, you know, to figure out one diagnosis from another. Um, when people ask me, am I a guinea pig? If I'm seeing a new patient, am I a guinea pig? I say, yes, 
You are a guinea pig because we don't understand who's gonna get better on what medicine. Everyone we see is a guinea pig. Um, we are experimenting with medicine because we don't have ability to predict who's going to respond to one medicine versus another. I'm not talking about medicines for substance use disorders. I'm talking about medications for things like anxiety, depression, um, you know, the common mental disorders. We don't have predictive uh, strategies. And this is very frustrating because I've been doing HIV and mental health since for 40 years. And in the beginning of HIV, for those of you who are old enough to remember, we didn't have an antibody test and we didn't know anything and we couldn't treat anything. And we've come so far in HIV in terms of what we understand biologically about it and how to treat it. And we have not come far in mental illness. We are still in the realm of mystery. <clears throat> now, sometimes I give these talks and people say, so why should we trouble? Why should we be bothered with this? Well, there's a huge literature to explain that mental, uh, that mental disorders are some of the most painful conditions that exist in the world. It's not only in the literature written by physicians, it's actually in literature. So one of my favorite quotes, and it was before the DSM, is Dante in the Divine Comedy as translated by John Chiardi, and he said of hell when he goes into Inferno, I did not die and yet I lost life's breath. That's one of the best descriptions of depression I've ever heard. What does he mean by lost breath? The ability to feel pleasure, the ability to feel motivated, the desire to do anything. You're there, you're alive, but there's so little to reward you for being alive um, that it's very easy to understand why people think it's not worth it. Maybe I should just take my life. Um, however, one of the things I've also learned by being old <clears throat> is that when you talk about the disability of mental illness, the world doesn't respond to it. I don't know why, you know? I mean, you can show so many harms of disability, but it's only when you talk about mental illness killing people that people wake up. I don't know why, it's just been my observation. So for example, it was only when um, the World Health Organization realized that mental illness could kill you that they thought, gee, now is the time to come up with some mental health guidelines uh, some, some healthcare guidelines for mental illness. I'm gonna therefore emphasize mortality just because apparently that works better. <clears throat> so here are some of the common causes of mortality associated with mental illness in people with HIV, um, and that is unrecognized delirium due to life-threatening medical conditions, tobacco smoking, suicide, intentional and, and unintentional overdoses, accidental death, and end organ damage from many different drugs. So I wanna, if there's anything you remember from my talk, I'd be so pleased if you remembered this. Delirium kills people on a regular basis because they present with an abnormal mental status and we train healthcare providers to act like they, they, they do walking down the street. So let's say you're walking down the street one night, you see somebody coming to you, and they look suspicious. What are you going to do? Avoid them, right? As best you can. Well, we do the same thing in the healthcare system. We don't train healthcare providers how to be with someone who's behaving abnormally. It's too scary. So the healthcare system is filled with teaching avoidance. Who can you call? It's not me who has to do it, right? So this is the reason why people die of um, c conditions that cause delirium, because any failure of any bodily organ can cause delirium. Your kidneys fail, your liver fails, um, you, you don't have enough oxygen. Everything can make you delirious. And some of those things will absolutely kill you. And um, it can be fatal, and I can tell you I've observed this everywhere that I've done work. Whether it's right in New York City in my own institution or whether I've been in, in doing some work in Sub-Saharan Africa, no matter where I am, I can tell you a list of people who died because they actually were at risk of death but were behaving in a way that wasn't normal, so they got sent to mental health. Um, <clears throat> and I think I really already covered this, you know, the, in, the accidental overdose, the suicide. Um, but I, I, I did want to mention, actually, because it's on the test, that if I go back, 
to unrecognized delirium, you'll notice that there was a question about a 53-year-old woman who had schizophrenia, diabetes, and um, uh, uh, HIV. And uh, the first thing to do was what? So most people answered it wrong. This was a person who suddenly had the onset of increased hallucinations. If you see a person with three disorders, HIV, schizophrenia, diabetes, what are you going to do first? The blood sugar, right? The blood sugar. And I can just tell you that uh, this was a real case of a woman who started to hallucinate more because her blood sugar was 600. Um, it had nothing to do with her schizophrenia. And that's also one of the problems that people with severe mental illness suffer from, which is that everyone assumes that everything they're doing is due to mental illness, when in fact there are a lot of superimposed medical conditions. So I just wanted to say that. <clears throat> now, I love studies that come from Scandinavia. If, if you live in Denmark, for example, D Denmark has free care, so we don't have no, there's no problem accessing care. So you don't have to take that into account when you look at outcomes, which is a very pleasurable idea, right? Imagine, no restrictions to care. Holy mackerel. But anyway, <clears throat> um, and uh, the other thing is that they track everything about every individual that's ever born. They know when you grew up, was there a loud dog barking on your street? Don't ask me how they know this or why they know this. Now, I've gone to talks where people have explained what they know about people who grew up in Scandinavia. They know everything about you. Okay, so this study in Denmark looked at uh, close to 3,000 people with HIV over the age of 35 and followed them for about 14,000 person years. Uh, and the number of years lost to life in, associate, in association with HIV was 5.1 years. But if you had HIV and you were smoking, it was 12.3 years. And I'm gonna show you the Kaplan-Meier curves for it. Um, so at the very top line, what you see is people who don't smoke or don't have HIV. Look at that. There you are in Denmark, and more than 75% of people live to be 80. Wow. Um, if you look at one line down, you see what smoking does to your lifespan. The next line down shows you what HIV does to your lifespan. But the very lowest line on this graph shows you what happens when you smoke and have HIV, both. These are people who are going to die young. There's no comorbidity that probably takes away people's lifespans um, that's in the mental health domain that is more powerful than smoking and killing our patients. Um, except for things like accidental overdose, but I mean in just in terms of the behavior. How about suicidal behavior? There aren't a lot of great studies in HIV, but someone just did a scoping review of all the studies that was published very recently in March of 2023. Um, they uh, put together every study they could find that was a legitimate study, 93 studies, 49 uh, countries, 53 were in the US. But I want to bring your attention to what they found for people in the US since 1997. They used 1997 because we know there was a high rate of suicide when HIV was untreatable. So they wanted to see what happens now that you can treat HIV. So these studies taken together suggested that in people with HIV, there's an attempted suicide rate between 17 and 21 percent. That's very high. And there's a completed suicide rate between 7.6 and 8.7 percent. This is not a national study. These are studies that are put together, done one place or another. We don't have national data on this. But even this data is scary enough to make you realize that suicide is one of the main things that's causing people to die uh, if they have HIV infection. <clears throat> and this is the, the question you got right. These are uh, mortality uh, patterns in people aged 25 to 44. I wish I could find something that was uh, that kind of covered other age spans, but you'll see that the red bar represents COVID disease. So in 2010, about 61% of people between the ages of 25 and 44 who died, died of COVID disease. In 2021, that's dropped to 33%. So that's about half what it used to be. If you look above the red bar and you see that hatched bar, that's overdose. So when you want to know what are young people with HIV in this category dying of, 
overdose. Now, I noticed that in this slide, which comes from the National HIV Surveillance System, they say unintentional overdose. I dare people to really figure out what was in the brain of someone who dies of an overdose, what they actually intended to be doing. <clears throat> um, and right above that little bar is also other forms of accidental death, which are often connected to substance use. So in fact, these are very important causes of mortality. I'm running out of time, but that's OK. In my workshop, I'm going to go over the many, many treatments we have in mental disorders and which ones might lend themselves to best to working in HIV care settings. Um, and I'm going to include in my workshop screening for mental illness, brief interventions, antidepressants in primary care, and models for integrating care. But I can tell you the bottom line is use the model that makes sense in the place where you are. It doesn't help to use a model somebody created in some other state, in some other place, which has absolutely nothing to do with your healthcare system. That's what's wrong with models. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, um, among people with HIV infection, death from HIV disease is diminishing, while death due to the direct effects of mental disorders are increasing. There's a great need to better integrate mental health and substance use services into HIV prevention, care, and treatment. And addressing mental wellness and mental illness is really the job of every healthcare provider um, who works with people with or at risk of HIV. And I'm going to conclude there, and I still have like four seconds left. <clears throat> Thank you so much for a wonderful overview. And uh, as people get to the microphone, let me tease this off. As structural impediments to managing mental health, you mentioned that we have an avoidance of people experiencing delirium. But I want to ask you whether we don't also have a criminalization. Because we call the police and they wind up in jail. Uh, yeah. You, good point. Good point. <clears throat> You know, somebody behaving abnormally could very well be someone who's dying. That's the sad thing. And it is true that not only is there a referral to psychiatry in the hospital setting, but there's criminalization. And this really interferes with saving lives. So thank you for that comment. So here's a question here about psychiatric medications. Any recommendations on blood tests available for predicting which medications will work <clears throat> for patients, i.e. antidepressants. Right. We have no way to predict which medicines will work, other than several possible things that don't directly predict it, but that you can ask. You can ask the patient, what are all the medicines you've ever taken, if they've taken prior medicines, and what was their response? And that helps if you know that a patient took something it didn't do any good. Um, you can also ask, um, if, these, if there are other family members with similar illnesses and what medicines worked for them. Because sometimes, you know, the medicine that worked for another family member might work for your patient. Um, if you want to, you can look at, um, you know, the cytochrome P450 system and figure out how people are metabolizing drugs. So that helps you to know if someone's a fast metabolizer or a slow metabolizer. We can figure that out. Um, and metabolism is highly variable, as we heard in a previous talk. But it, that doesn't tell you who's going to experience efficacy from a medication. Efficacy is trial and error unless you know a patient and they already know what helps them and what doesn't help them, which is a very important piece of history. And it's also a very important piece of looking at older medical records because it really is sad to put people through antidepressant trials, which take a long time to do, with a medicine that has previously been shown to not work. You know, it's, it's really using up a lot of energy for not much reward. Thank you. Next question, any guidance for primary care providers that can't get our patients into psychiatry? Right. <clears throat> So in my workshop, I'm going to talk about that. What do you do when you have 15 minutes? But I just want to say this. I learned the most about that when I did work in Rwanda. I, I did, um, you know, with uh, Columbia's ICAP program. Uh, I worked in Rwanda on individual trips. I didn't live there. On individual trips between 2009 and 2012. 
And Rwanda had two psychiatrists at that time. And it had no social workers. It had a group of n not very well educated trauma counselors. They had been brought in to deal with the Rwandan genocide. So in Rwanda, there was a terrible genocide in 1994. And one of the responses was to teach people how to do trauma, you know, trauma counseling. And these were the people who had some mental health skills. So there you are in a place, and you can't expect anything that's usual in the US. Yet, you still have to take care of patients. I can tell you that one of the biggest differences between working in a setting like that is that in Rwanda, although there was a, a, a real low level of resources available, if you had a good idea, you were allowed to use it. You could implement, like we implemented all kinds of things in the mental hospital there. You know, actually the, the people who were the physicians in the mental hospitals were mostly not psychiatrists. They were mostly just people who were trained in medicine and wound up in a, in a mental institution. It was therefore perfectly plausible to ask a psychiatric institution to start people on antiretroviral medication. We, you could never do that in the US. We have lost our flexibility. We are regulated up the wazoo. You move and someone tells you that's the wrong way to move. You have 15 minute, minutes with a patient, they say you have to check off these 16 things. I was in my first work workshop yesterday and I said, my response to a lot of this is defiance. I'm not recommending that. If I had 15 minutes with a patient, I would do what's important, let somebody argue with me. I can't tell you the number of things I was told to do by the State Office of Mental Health, the New York State Office of Mental Health, that were completely ridiculous. Um, and I didn't get fired for not doing them. So in my opinion, it's important to give priority to what the patient needs at that moment. And if you didn't check off a box, let them argue with you. Let them tell you you're a bad person. I, you know what, this is, <laughs> just to be funny, we were supposed to, for the New York State Office of Mental Health, ask people what they wanted to become and use that as the goal of our treatment plan. Like if a patient said, so we were treating mostly patients with psych psychotic disorders. If a patient said, I want to be Superman, you were supposed to write that down as the goal. <laughs> <laughs> And then you would have a set of steps for how the person was going to become Superman. <laughs> what? Why was this so important? Because they were very angry advocates who hated mental health. And they were convinced that all mental health people did, practitioners did, was abuse people with mental illness. And they had gotten ingrained into the state office of mental health. And they were used to cut services. Because after all, if the only reason why behavioral health providers are there to make money and they're not doing anything good for you, we don't need them. So a huge number of cuts took place under the, these, these, the auspices. Anyway, I refused to do it. I just said, oh, I'm not doing it. So I was one of 26 programs funded by the New York State Office of Mental Health. I was the only program that didn't do it. I was the only program that didn't do a lot of things. Because if something made no sense, I just couldn't see why I had to do it. Now, I, I mean, I, I got myself into plenty of trouble, but I didn't care. <laughs> because why should we do things that are idiotic? Really. Yeah. Dr. Kunos, the first step to becoming Superman is finding a cape. <laughs> All right. So here, a patient presents with syphilis and HIV title, uh, syphilis title 1 to 128. Now with cognitive impairment, not following commands and recommendations, what are your recommendations? So first of all, I don't know enough about syphilis to make a sensible recommendation, but I wanna just tell you my approach to cognitive impairment. Um, the brain is a mystery, as I've already said. Oh. Excuse me? Am no, I, no, no. Am I out of time? No, no, no. Um, be, be, because the brain is a mystery, we, we forget cognition changes from, from fetal life on. It's not that people age and develop cognitive impairment. People have a life of cognitive impairment and cognitive skills. For example, at the age of 15, we prune our brains. We get rid of a lot of the flexibility of our brains to learn things like new languages. So we speak with accents if we learn languages after 15. To learn a new instrument. 
So our brain has already gotten compromised at age 15. That's it. That's why psychiatrists make so much money. Because everyone sitting in the office, has a, in this audience, has a brain that at age 15 solidified into some pattern behavior. And if those patterns give you trouble, you don't know how to change them. Because that's what your brain is programmed to do. Mm. So a lot of psychiatry is teaching people, hey, what you learn in the first 15 years of life aren't the only strategies that you can use. There are other things you can do. So the brain is always changing. Now, I'm old. So I know my brain is changing, and I don't really know how, what to call it because reaction time is a very good example. Reaction time diminishes from the age of 40 on. By the time you're my age, your reaction time is much worse. Is that a cognitive impairment? I don't know. I like to think about what normal aging is and um, think about, you know, being in, be thinking about if someone is in the norm, I don't know if we should call it cognitive impairment. I really don't. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm much less, I know that we had to talk about, um, you know, Alzheimer's disease and other cog forms of cognitive impairment. But I will say that the clinical world of thinking about cognitive impairment is totally different than how the research world thinks about it. So the research world is so interested in all of the, you know, markers of the, what's in your brain, your tau, your amyloid. But people's level of functioning is very poorly correlated. So when you do a scan and you find things in people's brains, they might have absolutely no symptoms. What's more important, I think in the clinical setting, you know, what's it on an image in somebody's brain is gonna matter less than how your patient is functioning. So I like to go with Functioning, I like to go with age-appropriate expectation. Now, let's get back to syphilis. There's probably no one thing that causes cognitive impairment in people who are complex. Why should there be only one thing? Why can't you have the effects of syphilis, the effects of HIV, the effects of you know, using drugs all your life? and whatever that did to your cognition. Why do we need to have a thing? We don't really have a thing. We have multiple things and we don't understand them well. And <clears throat> I think that's okay. Because you know, every day those people in the uh, web telescope, they go out and they look to find something brand new about the universe that they've never seen before. So that's what we do in, in psychiatry. You know, we wanna know. What's something that has never been seen or known? That's what we're looking for. Thank you. And last question, microphone. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Cornus. I'm over here. To your right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think this is the west side. Um, He's from New York. From New York, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to first thank you and applaud you for um, this very frank discussion about mental health and, and kind of normalizing it and applaud your effort to personally share your own experiences to destigmatize this. Um, and so I want to give kind of a comment to add some weight to some of the things you said or some context to some of the things you said and then ask a question that we probably don't have time to answer, um, but I'll try to get an answer from you eventually. So my first comment is with me personally, I've gone through, I've had some uh, history of my, with myself. Um, I had brain cancer followed up by radiation, chemotherapy, tumor resection, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, and then I have a history of mental illness as well and I've gone through both of those battles. So to kind of add to the severity and the quality of life impact for myself, you know, in of one, but if I had to hypothetically pick one of those two to come back, it would be brain cancer, radiation, chemotherapy, the entire, I would pick that. And I just wanted to give that information to kind of add weight to the severity that mental health has on our quality of life. Um, so that's my comment. And my first question, or only question, is how do you implement improving mental health care across a state <clears throat> at large. Like I work at a state health department and in Arkansas we have uh, our care for mental health is, it, it, there's a lot of room for improvement. So what yeah. short tips do you so have? So I, I just wanna say, I'm like a dabbler. I like doing a little of this and a little of that. So one of the things that I dabbled in was being chair of the New York State Board for Medicine. While I was busy dabbling in it, I changed what's on the application for a new license. It used to say, do you have a mental disorder? I said, why are you asking it that way? You asked, do you have a medical illness that would interfere with the practice of medicine? You have to ask about mental illness the same way, otherwise it's stigma. 
And New York State changed it. It's not on my CV. But one of the things that I feel the proudest of, most of the things I feel the best about are you'd never find on my CV. But one of the things I feel the best about is that I actually got New York State to stop asking it that way. That's what we have to do. Thank you. We, we want people to treat mental illness similar to medical illness. We want to know if a physician can function, not what illnesses they have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pick up. So.